friends, a pleasant Sunday. Today is 6 August 2023. Being a Sunday should have been the 18th Sunday of ordinary time, but today the church is celebrating the Feast of the Lord, the Transfiguration. So the Feast of the Transfiguration overshadows the 18th Sunday of ordinary time. That's why we are not taking the readings. We are rather taking the readings of this feast. The first reading of today is taken from the book of Daniel. The second reading is from the letter of St. Peter, second letter of St. Peter, chapter 1, 16 to 19. And the transfiguration as is presented to us by St. Matthew because we are reading from St. Matthew's gospel this year. We have Mark's version and we have Luke's version, but today we read it, Matthew 17, verse one to nine. So what is the transfiguration about? Why is it that the church allows this feast to overshadow the 18th Sunday day of ordinary time? First, let's go to the readings of today and uh, I will try to situate the transfiguration in this ordinary time. God bless you. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory be to you, Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain on their own. In their presence, he was transfigured. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as dazzling as light. And suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter spoke to Jesus, saying, Lord, it is wonderful for us, for us to be here. If you want me to, I will make three shelters here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when suddenly a bright cloud covered them with shadow, and suddenly from the cloud there came a voice which said, This is my son, the beloved. He enjoys my favor. Listen to him. When they heard this, the disciples fell on their faces, overcome with fear. But Jesus came up and touched them, saying, Stand up, do not be afraid. And when they raised their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus himself alone. As they came down from the mountain, Jesus gave them this order. Tell no one about this vision until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Matthew 17, 1 to 9. Why is Jesus revealing himself to the three disciples, Peter, James, and John? on a mountain. You see, for Matthew, the mountain is a very important place. The transfiguration is set on a mountain. The Beatitudes is presented in Matthew chapter 5 on the mountain. The transfiguration takes place on the mountain. Jesus will tell the disciples again to go and meet him on the mountain in Galilee where his ascension will take place. Of old, the mountain was a place where God met with his people. You remember when Israel is coming out from Egypt, God is gradually meeting, assembling his people and he's calling Moses to the mountain Sinai. So at God invites Moses to the mountain to have a conversation with him, today Jesus God brings Peter, James and John to a scene, to a similar mountain where they can have a communion, a relationship, a conversation with God, a conversation with God. That is the first aspect, the transfiguration. The element of the transfiguration is this. In the New Testament, there are only four instances where the word metamorphosis in English transfigured is used. Here in Matthew 17, 2, and in Mark 9, 2, because it's also about the, uh, the transfiguration. The other two instances we read from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says, be transformed or be renewed in your minds so that you may be acceptable according to the will of God. You may be made perfect. Romans 12 to Paul uses the word metamorphosis in Greek, which is translated in English as be transformed or be changed, be renewed in your minds. So Paul is talking about a spiritual renewal because beloved, if I'm renewed in my minds, none of you can read my mind. But what happened to Jesus could be seen. That's why in the second reading of today, Peter is saying, we were eyewitnesses, they saw. It was not a mental renewal of Jesus. It was not an inward renewal of Jesus. It was a physical manifestation, transfiguration. His face was shining, it was brightening. His clothes became dazzling white. 
So Jesus' own was not a spiritual renewal. I was in Romans 12 to Paul says, be renewed in your mind. He's talking about a spiritual renewal. Once we embrace Christ, we should be renewed up here in our minds and in our heart. A spiritual renewal that God alone sees, perceives by his Holy Spirit. Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, he again becomes us. Because we have seen and counted the Lord, we are again asked to be transformed by his Holy Spirit. We reflect mirrors and we are called to reflect the image that we bear by this transformation. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. The image we bear is Christ's image. And we are being called to be conformed to that image, to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. These two instances by Paul, 2 Corinthians 3, 18 and Romans 12, 2, are spiritual transformations. So gradually in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, you come to understand that the transfiguration is, is, is gradual, it's a process. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, be renewed daily, gradually. And it is the Holy Spirit that does it. But Jesus' transformation happened in an instant. Why is the transformation, the transfiguration of Jesus, put in Matthew 17? Let me bring you to understand this. If you have time today after church or when you are back, look at Matthew 16, chapter 16, verse number 21. Jesus makes the first of what we call the three predictions of his passion or the three prophecies of his passion the three prophecies of his passion is that when jesus says the son of man is going to be betrayed he will be killed and he will die and he will uh, he will rise up again so pay attention mario 16 21 from then onwards jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to jerusalem and suffer grievously at the hands of the elders and chief priests and cribes and be put to death and be raised up on the third day then take him in aside Peter takes him aside and he tried to be, rebuke Jesus. Heaven preserve you. Lord, this will not happen to you. Jesus has spoken to them about parables, the beauty, the grandeur, how precious the kingdom of God is. You remember about three weeks now how we are reading the parables, presenting the kingdom of God as precious, as beautiful, as big, huge, that can bring in all people. Then these disciples are expecting to be part of this kingdom. Then all of a sudden, Jesus says, I am going to die. So if you are going to die, what about these parables you presented to us about the kingdom? It's beauty, it's grandeur. So Peter takes him aside. Because of the fear, the sorrow, Christ sees in the hearts, the lives of these disciples. He takes them up a high mountain where they can commune with God, converse with him, to come to the realization that, yes, that walk with him is not becoming futile. He's not going to die to leave them off on snow. So he takes them up the high mountain and he reveals to them the glory that which will be theirs. That process of transfiguration that has begun in 2 Corinthians 3, 18. That renewal of minds, Paul is asking us, will be fully manifested. So Christ, give them a glimpse. Peter, James, and John, I'm not going to die to leave you orphans. This is what I'm presenting to you. So Christ takes our human nature to reveal the glory of God. You remember when we were talking about the, the precious blood last month in, in July represented to you why Jesus had to take himself or upon himself our human nature. Today, it is this human nature that is transfigured. Became brilliant, shining like the sun. More than the sun, his clothes became white. I'm bringing you to that understanding of why the clothes became white. So you have understood it. He brings them on the mountain to tranquilize them. So that's why I said that the, uh, the, tra uh, the transfiguration is a tranquilizer, something that calms you. You are worried and the Lord presents something to calm you, a tranquilizer. That is the transfiguration. To bring serenity, calm to the lives of these disciples who are worried because Jesus has made the first prediction of his death. Why? Are they seeing a physical transfiguration, transformation, change in Jesus? We remember in Matthew 13, when at home, after Jesus' parables, he comes to them 
and he tells them, the disciples ask him, why do you speak to the crowds in parables? He says, yes, for them, I reveal the mysteries of God to them in parables, but to you, I speak plainly. Today on the mountain, Jesus reveals himself plainly and not in parables. To the crowds, it is true parables. But for you, it is plainly. He speaks to them plainly. Friends, why are we celebrating transfiguration on this Sunday when we should have been celebrating the 18th Sunday of ordinary time? This is the reason. The church celebrates mysteries. The baptism is a mystery. The death of Christ is a mystery. His incarnation, he becoming man is a mystery. But we as Christians, at times we don't understand these things. So when a feast falls on a Sunday, the church pauses and makes us reflect on one of these mysteries. And I bring you to 1 Timothy 3.16. Paul says, great is our mystery. And not only great, it is beautiful. I shared with you some few times ago, some few days ago. Listen, 1 Timothy 3, 16. Paul writes, Without doubt, the mystery of our faith or religion is very deep. What is it then? What is the mystery of this faith? Christ was made visible in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. He was seen by angels, proclaimed to by the Gentiles, believed in throughout the world, and taken up in glory. The mystery of your faith as a Christian, as a Catholic, is beautiful, is great. And today, we are celebrating one of the mysteries. When Christ, who has assumed a human nature, tells us that this human nature will be transformed, will be transfigured, so that all of us will reflect God in the end. So if in this walk, our daily work, our daily experiences, our weekly experiences, in our monthly difficulties, in our yearly difficulties, we think, you have made a wrong choice in becoming Christian. No. Your renewal, transfiguration is a process. Second Corinthians 3.18. So be renewed in your minds. Not be listening to folk tales and lies. Then I bring now you to, I bring you now to Moses and Elijah. Two witnesses from the Old Testament. Moses representing the law. Elijah representing the prophets. You remember there were two figures who were also called to the mountain. Moses in Exodus 19, in Exodus 24, oftentimes, in even Exodus 33, 34, he was called to the mountain. And in chapter 34, his face was chained and his people could not behold his face. Exodus 34, 33 to 34. When Moses had communicated with God, he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. His face had become dazzling white. The people of Israel could not speak to Moses, so Moses had to veil his face. Paul makes reference to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14, verse 12 to 14, that the people of Israel could not behold Moses' face that has been transformed, was dazzling because he communicated with God. And here you are, Peter and James and John. They beheld Jesus' face that was shining more than the sun, dazzling more than the sun. They saw it. They did not cover their face. They covered their face only when Peter started talking and the cloud came over them. They saw physically. It was not an invisible transformation. It was not an invisible transfiguration. It was a physical transfiguration. They saw it. Israel of old couldn't look at Moses. Today we have three disciples. They see Jesus' face shining. You can't watch the sun, but Peter and James and John saw Jesus' transfiguration. How beautiful. So the witness for you to assure you that, yes, we have witnesses of both the Old and New Testament. For Peter, James, and John, Elijah and Moses will serve as a witness for them. Because in the book of Deuteronomy, the Lord has stipulated Israel to accept a judgment based on the witness of two or three people. So today, Moses and Elijah represent, of course, the law and the prophets, but they said as witness, witnesses for Peter, James, and John. For us today, we have the Old Testament witness, Moses and Elijah, and you have the New Testament witness, Peter, James, and John. How fortunate we are. Peter, James, and John had only Old Testament witnesses, two people. We have three 
So that what scripture says in Matthew 18, 18, where two or three are gathered there in their midst are am. So two are gathered, Moses and Elijah, three, James, Peter, and John, and there you see Jesus in their middle. How beautiful this faith is. How beautiful this mystery is. That is why we are celebrating on this Sunday, the Feast of the Transfiguration. Then the change of clothes, dazzle and white. When you study apocalyptic theology, eschatology, the figure of, of or the image of white clothes was always an image concerning the end times, apocalypticism. So it is something that brings our mind to that which will happen at the end of time. And a clear example, Matthew gives us example in Matthew 28, verse 8. The angel that the women saw at the tomb of Jesus, Matthew presents the angel as dressed in white clothing. So for you to understand that the image of dazzling clothes, white clothes was an image of the future glory. Let's look at Matthew 28, 8, Revelation 3, 3, and Revelation chapter 4. But first, Matthew 28, listen, what they saw. So in Matthew 28, this is what they saw. Matthew 28, verse 3. After the Sabbath, and towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary of Magdalene and the other Mary went to the sepulchre, the tomb. And suddenly there was an earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled the stone away and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his robes white as snow. Matthew 28, 3. The angel, the robes of the angel were as white as snow. Where are the angels? You know where the angels abide. I tell you that the angels do not have permanency in our world. They come only for a short time. And God grants them the opportunity to manifest this way to us. So the clothing of this angel to show us just that life we will live. That's why in Luke 20, when the Pharisees, those who did not satisfy the question about the resurrection, Jesus said, after life, we will not be given in marriage because you will become like angels. After this life, there will not be marriage. You will become like the angels. So this image of the angels carrying white clothing is just a sign to remind us that of that life we will live after here. Now let me take you to Revelations chapter 3 and chapter 4. Chapter 3 verse 4 and chapter 4 verse 4. To the church in Saldus. This is what John says. Yet there are few in Sardis who have kept their robes unstained, and they shall come with me dressed in white in the future glory. They are dressed in white since they are worthy. Since they are worthy. Anyone who is victorious will be dressed like this in white robes. A sign of the eschatology. You'll be dressed in white clothes. So if Jesus' clothes became white, it's a sign of the future glory. Christianity is not a fake religion. We are promised a better life than this. Chapter 4, Revelations 4. This is what we read. The 24 elders were clad in white clothing. They were singing around the throne. Where are the 24 elders? The presence of God in heaven. The presence of God in heaven. So Peter decides to talk. Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you want, I'll build three things. A day in God's presence is better than a thousand elsewhere. Psalm 84 verse 10. Peter wanted to be there. But the Lord Jesus says, no, let's go. We need to descend. To continue living this life. Before we can merit this transfiguration. So when they were descending, he told them, do not tell anybody about this vision until after the resurrection. Friends, Jesus has resurrected 2,000 years on and people still don't believe that he was transfigured. People don't accept this mystery that we will be transformed and we will come to live a beatific life. We will come to experience the beatific life. 2,000 years on. He told the disciples to keep this as a secret. Believing that after the resurrection, we are going to embrace it. And today I'm here with you, since August. There are people, Africans, Americans, Europeans, who do not accept this. It's difficult, yes. Our life experiences can make faith difficult. People can reject it, can deny God, can reject God, can be blasphemous. 
because of their daily experiences. So you don't judge these people. But for those of us who are still able to maintain this faith, we need to thank God because it is not easy. If somebody denies God, declares himself as an atheist, an unbeliever, ask the person why he's going through these things. But for us who continue to believe, it's still grace that maintains us. That we still hold on to that faith, accepting that gradually we are going through this process of transfiguration that will be completed when Christ is fully manifested. Friends, how do we leave this word today? In the first reading of today, Daniel has this image about the ancient of days whose throne is established, then the Son of Man appears in glory. His kingdom will not pass. The Son of Man appears in all his glory. In the New Testament, the Son of Man is Jesus Christ. And he establishes a kingdom that will not pass away. But this kingdom will be fought against, will be attacked, will be blasphemed. This kingdom that is manifested in glory will be attacked in all ways, in so many aspects. That is a kingdom you and I have been invited to live in. Amidst the difficulties, the challenges, the incomprehensions, the doubts. Then Peter, in the second reading of today, says, Do not worry when these doubts, we face these doubts. We were facing sin. So we saw this with our own eyes. We were eyewitnesses to what happened on the mountain. Dearly beloved, I want to conclude this with these few words. The first is from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 12 to 14. Paul was quoting Exodus 34, 33 to 34. Moses in Exodus 34, verse 33 to 34, encounters God. And after that encounter, he had to cover his face because the people couldn't see his shining face. Here we are, St. Paul writes, we have seen Christ, but with uncovered faces. Christ's face is not covered. What a privilege that Israel could not see watch a normal person like Moses. Here we are, we are presented with Christ. Today, when you go for Mass, or next week, when you receive the Holy Eucharist in your hands, what do you see? Christ unveiled. When the priest has consecration, elevates the sacred host and you look at it, Christ unveiled. That is why at times at Mass, those high Masses where incense is used, Paul Benedict explains that the incense must be true. You see Mass service wafting the terrible so that you see incense. God is descending as glory. And that glory that we behold, the incense must cover God's glory because no man is worthy to behold that glory of God. As Isaiah saw it in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3 to 4, and he was, he was shouting, Woe to me, I've seen God. I'm not worthy to leave. You and I behold God in church every Sunday. For those who participate in weekdays, you behold God every week. What effect that this presence of God brings to your life? Two, Peter, James, and John had only two witnesses. Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. We have five witnesses, two from the Old, three from the New Testament. We are not called to live in wokeism that denies past witnesses. And this happens most often in Africa, especially in Ghana. Because I come to know so many young people, when you tell them that our faith is based on something that we have lived more than 2,000 years, and you quote them, to them. Recently, I was speaking to someone. He says, "Oh, Jesus is not historical. Jesus didn't live. Show us documents that prove that Jesus lived." A young man. He's rejecting every witness from the Old Testament. And I quoted him three pe persons: Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, then two pagans. Pagans. That was they were not Christians. Plinius the Young and Tacitus. Tacitus is spelled T-A-C-I-T-U-S. All these three people who were not Christians wrote about Christ and the existence of Christianity. How many years ago? About 2,000 years. When this guy had not even seen the light of day. And today he's confusing people that Jesus is not historical. Friends, we have witnesses from the old and we have witnesses from the new. What are you basing your faith on? That you allow yourself to be swamped away, blown away by lies. 
and flimsy presentation of doctrines that have no basis. I'm telling you, all those confusing you, what are the bases? What are the bases? What are their sources? You have a source. You have scripture. You have a source, the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah. You have a source, the three disciples, two witnesses of old, three witnesses in the new. These people confusing you. Ask for their sources. Okay, you that you are asking me not to believe Jesus that is historical. What is your source? Because you are denying Plinius the young. You are denying Tarsius. You are denying Joseph who is the historian. So show me your source so that I want this. You don't ask for them. And they throw these things away to you like that. Friends, Christ is assuring us that this mystery that we have embraced is not fake and it's not futile. The mystery of our religion is great, First Timothy 3.16. No matter the difficulties that we go through, things we hear, things we face, we experience in our bodies, like how the disciples felt when Christ announced the passion in Matthew 16, 21. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed. He will die and he will resurrect. May Christ take us up today on a mountain, a place of refuge, where he will reveal himself to us again. That revelation has already started. It's a process. But today, Sunday, let's pray that he will take us to a secluded place. We're alone with him in the comfort of our homes, the comfort of your office, in the comfort of your car. You alone with Christ. He will reveal his presence, his touch, his words to console you. We need another tranquilizer. Lord Jesus, on this Sunday, give us another tranquilizer. Give us another tranquilizer. The mystery of our faith is great. I ask you this Sunday, have you understood the mystery of your faith? Or you are being blown away? May the Lord be with you. Have a blessed Sunday. Amen.